Greetings, everybody. Welcome to a Lighthouse Briefing from the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California. I'm Graham Walker. Um, we are so delighted to have a lot of friends with us for this private call today. Um, we really love to offer these Lighthouse Briefings to give our friends uh, who help make this work possible a kind of front row seat to the work that we're doing, um, which you all really make possible. And we're going to talk about the burgeoning problem of homelessness today, uh, featuring especially um, our Senior Vice President, Mary L.G. Thoreau. Mary, welcome. Thank you, Graham. And thank you, Errol, for joining us today. It's so nice to see Mary, of course, and all of our friends. I can see a list of people, many of whom I know from around the United States who are joining us, Mary, uh, who want to know um, what's up with homelessness in California and around the nation and uh, what we're doing about it. I'm especially glad to have Mary with us because Mary, as our senior vice president, is the one who's kind of leading the way uh, on the subject for us here at the Independent Institute. And of course, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we get pretty much a front row seat, speaking of front row seats, on the problem of homelessness. I was looking uh, at some data recently, Mary, which suggested that in a uh, most recently measured 12-year period, that overall, surprisingly enough, homelessness in the nation declined by 12%, but in California, it went up by uh, 15%, in San Francisco by 31%, and in Oakland, where we are, by 47%. Um, is this problem growing or shrinking? It's exploding. Um, it's, it's really tragic. In San Francisco, there are officially 10,000 people homeless, but estimates are up to double or more of that. But more importantly, it's the conditions, um, the conditions on the street, which unfortunately are often used as fodder for national and local TV news, are really horrendous. And the, the news stories only give a, a slight glimpse of it to walk around on our streets and which see Which you have people. done recently yourself. You know, unfortunately, yes. And it's just, it's like something out of a dystopian movie, only it's it's real life for too many people, and it's destroyed what was once arguably the most beautiful city in the world. So it's a, it's a tremendous tragedy. Yeah, it, and it's, you know, we, we, we notice it as we go around the city and around some of the encampments around the sides of the freeways here in Oakland and so forth. Um, it's a visual issue, but it's so much more than a visual issue because these are human beings who are somehow victims of the system, it seems, but it's it's uh, it's not the usual kind of system that people talk about, is it, Mary? No, I mean, there's a lot of talk about inequality and systemic racism and so on, but it's really, it's, you know, none of those things are helpful ways of talking about it. These are individual human beings. And one thing I've learned in delving into this is there are probably as many uh, causes for becoming homeless as there are individuals experiencing homelessness. Certainly every individual has their own story. Um, a vast driver of it is trauma. And you and our viewers probably don't need me to tell them that we have a real problem with the American family. We have too many households headed by single mothers in poverty, and uh, they're very uh, traumatic places to live, often in very violent neighborhoods. And we also have uh, increasing numbers of uh, children growing up in, ho in homelessness themselves and then growing into being adults in homelessness. And this creates tremendous trauma, which often manifests as mental illness, mm -hmm. um, often leads to substance abuse and so on. There's also adult trauma, uh, late in life hospitalization, um, divorce. And we hear about the impact of divorce on women and children, but I've talked to many men who fell into addiction and homelessness following the loss of their family through divorce. Mm -hmm. And we, mm -hmm. we just don't think about the impact on men of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, there is an economic, there's certainly an economic aspect of it. The high cost of housing in California is a driver, um, losing a job, uh, being evicted, and so on. Um, but it's a very complex issue. And again, it's a very individual issue. I'm thinking um, there are a lot of canards or maybe urban legends, I don't know what the right word is, um, that people hear about this. So, for example, here in California, I have often heard it said, oh, yeah, homelessness has grown because Governor Ronald Reagan closed down the mental, hosp mental health hospitals. Um, tell me the true or false value of that one. In 1963, 
JFK signed an order defunding state mental hospitals. Um, he'd been advised by a man uh, who had spent a summer in a state mental institution. And honestly, Graham, it wasn't necessarily a bad decision. State mental hospitals were not ideal places. We are Right. And, and we certainly are not in favor of, uh, of uh, committing people against their wills to the state and so on. Um, psychiatry has come a long way since then, I will say. But meanwhile, the problem is that all of these people, all of the patients of the hospitals were released and they had nowhere to go except the streets or prison. Um, theoretically, they were going to establish community uh, mental health centers, which would help people on an outpatient basis. But either they were not established or the model of them was really ineffective and it didn't actually help people. So what Ronald Reagan did do as governor uh, was in 1967 was recognize that these community mental health centers were not helping people and he defunded them. But it goes to JFK. So um, Right. And so, I mean, we're talking right about 40 some years ago um, and the dramatic increase in homelessness has been within the last 15, 20 years, it doesn't really stem uh, prim primarily in these numbers from 40 actions taken 40 years ago, does it? Well, in a way it did. I mean, yeah, yeah we had the mentally ill off the streets in terrible places. Uh, the problem is we've never replaced access to mental health for the vast number and growing number of people who, who need it. As I said, there's a lot of trauma that's creating mental illness, as well as other causes for mental illness in this country. And um, families find themselves unable to take care of them. They're unable to find care for them. Right. And mm -hmm. people do end up in the streets. So we desperately need mental health. Uh, what the government's doing is, I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago, and one of the members of the audience's daughter is a public mental health provider. And she's, she has a caseload of 5,000. Oh my heavens. I mean, who would come up with a system like that? It's just, it's right. just insane. So with, with those pieces uh, beginning to percolate some decades ago, then California, um, as a public policy matter, launched into a series of new regulations on housing and residential construction, which have had a perverse and I hope unintended effect to exacerbate the problem of access to housing at the lower income levels. Can you talk a little bit about how housing policy feeds into these human factors? Yeah, I mean, it's just... In the, not the irony, but the idiocy of the government claiming that it has to provide affordable housing is the fact that it's what destroyed affordable housing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in the name of urban renewal, it destroyed entire neighborhoods. You can think the Fillmore, which was a thriving, uh, largely African-American neighborhood in San Francisco. The replacement high rises that the utopians said were going to be such a better place to live were never built. Um, meanwhile, in the name of blight, Thousands of units of low-cost, cheap housing, including single-room occupancy hotels, were destroyed. Um, rent control drove a lot of rental units into owner occupancy and so on. And all of these measures are just elite, paternalistic, uh, you know, blight's terrible. These neighborhoods are terrible. It doesn't you know, look nice. It doesn't look good. <laughs> but the end result, as you said, is it's completely knocked off the lower rungs of the housing ladder. And so the alternative now is the street or illegal places like the ghost ship in Oakland that you know had a horrible tragedy oh, terrible, several yeah. years ago. But there are no, there's no cheap place for people to live. And people, uh, those who, who are in the business of building residential housing, in California, you can't make money building at the bottom end of the market, only at the middle or the top end of the market because of things like what you called inclus inclusive zoning because of CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act, which enables anybody to, to object to any construct residential construction for any reason whatever in the name of environmental quality. You, you can just count on several years of delay for any residential construction in California due to CEQA. I think you mentioned to me something about uh, prevailing wages too. How does that play into it? Well, for developments, yeah, the, many of the contracts call that they have to you have to pay prevailing wages, which are union wages versus market wages. That's the least of the problem. I mean, it's not even that you can't afford to build uh, low-cost housing. I mean, they can't. Builders can't. 
You can't build anything in California now, literally. Um, the Board of Supervisors j just yesterday voted down a new 500-unit housing unit in south of Market, um, which the progressive mayor, London Breed, is very upset about them, saying, you know, you wonder why rents are rising when you're refusing to allow new development. Uh, anybody can stop anything from being built with no reason in California. Uh, it's the only state of the union in which you're not allowed to build what your property is legally zoned for, and anybody can stop you from using your property for for no reason whatsoever. It's just insanity. Um, one of our housing, Lawrence McQuillan, our senior fellow, in a, did a great study on housing, and his proposal is just a return to common basic principles, which is make it legal Give, make it a right for people to be able to build what's legal on their property and no one else have a right to stop them. Now, almost anywhere else in the country, people would say, what? You have to, you have to say that? <laughs> right. But you, you know what's fascinating is that on the one hand, you could just like take that slice of the question, namely, um, how come property owners can't build residential construction on their own properties. And, and at that point, taken by itself, it sounds like, oh, it's a gripe. You know, we want homeowner, we want uh, landowners to be able to do what they want. But, but that piece of the pie turns out to be related to this other huge social problem. Namely, uh, people are being pushed out of housing, can't find housing when they have other things going on in their lives and maybe could get themselves going again. The housing market has been so destroyed uh, that there's just not enough uh, uh, regular commercial uh, housing available to them. So the two sides of this coin are just so interwoven with one another, two sides being the way California regulation has constricted housing, and of course that drives up the prices, and then the fact that there's a whole bunch of needy, vulnerable people who then are pushed to the margins and then onto the streets. You, you can't solve the one without the other. And it's not just the needy and the vulnerable. I mean, there's a lot of talk about equity and inequality yeah. mm -hmm. and how we want to address inequality. Well, the biggest factor in California's massive inequality is the cost of our housing. Right. And the reason our housing is so expensive is because it's illegal to build and we're short three million units of housing in the state. So if people really cared about helping the middle class, much less the poor and the homeless. And reducing inequality and reducing inequality and equity and so on, they get rid of all of these things that make anybody able to stop any development whatsoever and just let people provide the kind of housing that people want mm -hmm. where they want it. Like when our parents grew up and anybody virtually could own their own home. Yeah, there was all, all ranges of costs, but now the bottom is gone. You can't buy, you can't opt in because of these regulations, which makes it even the worse for those who are um, you know, badly off or have. Yeah, and it not only uh, pushes people into homelessness, but we're facing an issue now. We'll talk about my work with the Salvation Army. We're, we're designing a program to uh, help people get out of homelessness. But we face this dilemma. Once somebody's you know, prepared to live independently, where, do, where the, can they live? Yeah, where can they go? It's terrible. Um, I was talking before about some of these canards or urban legends. Another one that one often hears is that, well, homelessness is a life cho lifestyle choice, and we, we should respect this lifestyle choice as being as equally valid as any other lifestyle choice. Um, true or false, Mary? It depends on your view of choice. I mean, it's true that a large uh, majority of people who are living the streets are mentally ill or are abusing substances, whether that's what led to them to the streets or they started using substances to sort of soften the pain of living in the streets. So are people who are not in a position of their full faculties really able to make a choice uh, right. is a question. Mm -hmm. But again, as I went through before, there, there are so many reasons that people become homeless um, that there need to be a whole lot of ways of getting them out of homelessness. So um, here at the Independent Institute, as I said, we, we've got a kind of a vantage point on the problem. Um, what's Independent Institute doing about it and what are others doing about it that makes sense? Well, this has been a really wonderful project to be involved in because it's truly a case of independent moving ideas into action. Um, we've, we got involved in this issue 
Uh, we've produced a very thorough policy report on the issue um, that goes in, it's been the last two years, many of our fellows working on it, including me, um, goes into the root causes of homelessness, the policies and approaches that are feeding it and their outcomes. Then it looks at alternative approaches and those outcomes. And finally, it proposes transformative solutions that would achieve superior outcomes here, uh, such as we found elsewhere. So that's been very exciting. Maybe I should show them the, uh, the the cover of the report. It looks like this. This has just been made available. Uh, we haven't done our big public promotion and launch of it yet, but it's available to the public through a website that Mary will show us in a minute. Beyond Homeless, Good Intentions, Bad Outcomes, Transformative Solutions. Uh, and so uh, there is a short executive summary of it, um, but this is a very detailed, what is it, some 70 pages of analysis, right, Mary? Plus footnotes and other things. Yes, it's it's extremely uh, thorough, and uh, we've gotten very good, well, peer reviews from it and then re uh, responses from people with whom we have shared it who are experts in the area are, are all very, uh, very favorably um, impressed by it. The reason the reason we did this, though, is the very exciting part is that Independent Institute is part of a real community-based coalition that's been formed in San Francisco. It uh, consists of 33 for-profit firms like Gensler and WebCore, uh, property developers, land use attorneys, as well as nonprofits, including service providers, and very importantly, the Salvation Army. And we're all coming together to devise a solution to a problem that government, frankly, has failed to solve in the 40 or 50 years. It's been devoting a lot of resources to it. Uh, so we're coming alongside the Salvation Army, which is one of the largest nonprofit landowners in San Francisco, for it to redevelop six of its properties to provide up to 1,600 new beds of transformative housing uh, for people going through recovery, workforce development training, life skills training, for people to be able to find a way out from the streets to full self-sufficiency. And it's a very exciting uh, coalition that's formed and, and just a, a Tocquevillian example of the kinds of ways that Americans used to come together to solve our own problems and can be an example to others. Again, San Francisco is ground zero for homelessness. So if we can demonstrate success here, Imagine the ripple effect of other of the example to other communities. What I find encouraging about this in particular is that San Francisco has always been understood, at least for the past several decades, as sort of on the cutting edge of pushing a progressive approach to all public problems, um, which has had a lot of downside. But for that very reason, I think San Francisco may be the place where disenchantment with the unintended bad outcomes of many of those policies begins to become visible. Uh, and so that makes people more receptive to a different way, namely not simply having government entities mandate, fund, et cetera, one so-called solution or another, but having non-governmental entities come together uh, in community forms, like you said, Tocquevillian. Um, maybe San Francisco is the place where that, the virtue of that approach will become obvious more quickly. Uh, and, and you're about to go public with this too, right, Mary? Uh, yes, so we're about to launch, and, and I mean, a key part of the issue is helping the community understand the causes of homelessness. There's a lot of misunderstanding about who the homeless are, why people become uh, homeless, and then what government is doing that's either helping or not helping it. And then, very importantly, as Independent always does, is showing solutions. So in addition to the policy report, which does that, we decided we needed to produce a documentary, uh, which mirrors it. It's a short 38-minute documentary. And again, it looks at the problems in San Francisco, it looks at the individuals experiencing homelessness in San Francisco, uh, looks at the policies here that are driving that. And then we showcase a very remarkable uh, model uh, which, again, the, this coalition in San Francisco is hopefully going to replicate here. Um, we have a trailer. Graham, now mm -hmm. might be a good time yeah. to share that. Okay, so don't worry, friends. This is like a couple minutes only. It's not long. Here is the short trailer, and hopefully I can get this going for you in the right way. San Francisco, the city by the sea. California really was the Golden State when I arrived in the 70s. The streets of San Francisco were vibrant, free, and filled with hope. 
now my beloved San Francisco has become known as ground zero for our nation's homelessness crisis. Things are worse now for the homeless than ever. San Franciscans have reached a tipping point. After 40 years of failed approaches to reverse homelessness here, these once hopeful streets are filled with despair and brokenness. And until we tackle this problem, this will be our narrative. There isn't enough drug treatment for everybody in the city. What are you doing with all this money that has been allotted to the city? Where's that going? So there's almost no development that anyone has a legal right to do in California. We have pitted the smallest differences against each other. You cannot arrest this issue away. You cannot arrest homelessness away. Nobody is doing anything transformational. Leaving people untreated is murder. We're throwing vast resources at this issue, and it just keeps going up. Really, we can't come up with anything better than that? Beyond Homeless, Finding Hope is an exploration of what's driving the homelessness crisis here in California and a look at alternative approaches around the country that offer hope with real solutions. Join us in changing the narrative of our nation's homelessness crisis. Wow, nicely done, Mary. It was beautifully produced. We really thank our partners at Emerge in Order, um, and it was it was a labor of love. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. So um, I did notice uh, in passing there that there was that commentary about 40 years of failed approaches and very briefly flashed across the screen an image of uh, Gavin Newsom, former mayor, Willie Brown, former mayor. Um, which gave us a little clue as to the political background. But really, that's no longer the point, is it? It's not really a left-right thing, even in San Francisco. No, it's not. And it's really, um, the whole thing's been driven by this uh, continued narrative that the federal government can create a silver bullet to all of our problems. Mm -hmm. You know, it's failed with education, and it's certainly failed with homelessness. Um, homelessness has been going kind of up and down around. And then in 2009, the federal government changed its funding uh, under the Hearth Act and shifted all of it, the resources directed to what's called permanent supportive housing or housing first. Permanent supportive housing. That sounds wonderful. Well, uh, <laughs> There's a couple problems with it. First of all, the Independent Institute uh, were grounded in a commitment to human worth and dignity and putting, deciding that the solution is for people to be in permanent supportive housing is mm. essentially saying they need to be warehoused. They, they, they're going to be in stasis the rest of their lives. There's no possibility of movement to their full potential. So morally, it's just pretty bankrupt. But uh, even on a utilitarian level, it's completely bankrupt. It's, it's, it's removed funding from shelters, from transitional housing, and so on, which is leaves people on the street with nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they promise they're going to build permanent supportive housing, but it's incredibly expensive. Here in California, it costs 500000 750000 up to $900,000 per unit. Affordable That's housing per unit. Per apartment yeah. for permanent supportive housing. So the issue is that all the resources go into the housing, which isn't produced at a very high rate, certainly very, <laughs> way more, less than we need. And secondly, it robs all of the resources so that there aren't any resources available for the so-called support that they promise. And again, there's not an array of help that people need. These are individuals. They need individual choices. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems that there is an example of how to do this elsewhere that might be relevant here. And I think there's a, a pay, paid attention to that in a, a major part of our documentary. Can you talk about examples elsewhere that could work here? Yeah, so while we were doing the policy report, we looked at a lot of programs around the country, um, and I visited quite a few places, but there was one that really uh, demonstrates community-wide solution at scale, which is mm. what's needed. It's great that there are these programs that hurt, help you know, 30 or 100 or 200 people, but we have a massive problem uh, that impacts our entire community, and we need a solution that impacts our entire community and does so at the scale that's needed. So what we found was in San Antonio, Texas, it's called Haven for Hope, and it's in a campus that provides a full array, everything from 
There's a shelter, safe sleeping shelter. You can be high or, or drunk or whatever. Um, and it gives you a safe place to sleep. You can have your possessions, get meals, showers, etc. Uh, it also provides safety to the community as you remove people from uh, the streets to a safe place. And then importantly, the largest part of the campus is called the transformational portion. Mm. And uh, it provides long-term recovery and then very individualized assistance for people to identify and overcome the barriers that are in their way to becoming fully self-sufficient. Um, it's a wonderful community-based model. It was created, it, it was the brainchild of a local businessman who saw a newscast about homelessness and grew very concerned. The next day, he called the Democratic mayor whose election he had opposed, uh -huh. and they did not have a good relationship. <laughs> But the mayor had also been talking out about homelessness, and the businessman said, you know, are you, do you really want to do something about this? He said, yes. He said, well, I want to be a part of it. Uh, the mayor formed a task force, made the businessman the chairman of the task force, and then they immediately involved every part of the community, the community activists, representatives from every area, all the nonprofits. Uh, they visited 200 shelters around the country, and they created the Haven for Hope which involves, again, every single nonprofit is on campus. Police, EMS, fire is involved. They have a 1,000 volunteers on campus, so the entire community is involved in it. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful solution, and it could be done everywhere. Um, and it, how does this, just to be really clear, you know, because you understand some of these details way more than I do or many just ordinary citizens. Um, all of that sounds attractive, and I love the way that it, it, it draws people into it rather than hitting them over the head. Um, it's, it's different, however, from what we hear oftentimes uh, about government programs where all that stuff that you just described, it, it isn't being funded primarily um, or driven primarily by legal changes or appropriations for the Texas state legislature, is it? It's more broad-based. Yeah, so the Haven campus was actually built with private funding. The The city gave the land. Um, it wasn't terrible. I mean, it cost $100 million in total, so $60 million to build it, and then the cost of the land. Um, on an ongoing basis, it's they have up to 1,700 people on campus at any given time, and wow. the operating budget is is really reasonable. Um, it's, a, it's a collaboration between private funding and city state and county funding. Again, they can't get any federal funding because it doesn't adhere to the, oh. uh, you can't require recovery and, and participation in services to get federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, but they're doing it and they're making a huge success of it. So that that's a pretty fascinating distinction, isn't it? I mean, just kind of going back to the heart of this kind of um, policy matter uh, or the protocol of helping people who are homeless. Um, you mentioned that alternative approach that has repeatedly failed is called housing first or permanent supportive housing. But that's typically or almost always coupled with this notion that you can't expect anything of those who are being helped. And so the Haven for Hope solution in San Antonio sounds like that at least when you get in the inner part of the, the program, um, you receive a lot of help and you're expected to make progress toward self-recovery. And that's that's considered a no-no by the housing first proponents, right? No, yeah, I won't. I wouldn't say the permanent supportive housing doesn't is a total failure. It does help some people. We're mm -hmm. simply saying that we're dealing with individuals, and you cannot expect a one size fits all uh, solution to serve the needs of everyone. And that's all we're saying is we need to expand mm -hmm. the array of solutions that are made available. Uh, participating in the program, the the longer term programming at Haven for Hope is purely voluntary. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to go into recovery, wants to get this help to move on with their lives, they are welcomed and they are helped uh, excessively. If they don't want to, that's fine. They can stay in what's called the courtyard. Mm -hmm. um, they can come and go as they please. There is a curfew at night, which keeps both them and the surrounding community very safe. Um, the difference is that there is now a place that's available for people. And so if somebody is sleeping downtown on a sidewalk or so on, 
uh, the police or others can say, look, there's a place that you can go and you'll be safe, you'll be warm, you'll have food. May I take you there? Mm -hmm. um, and they do not allow encampments on a wide scale as we do and so on. They have a place for people to go that respects their dignity, that is loving. I mean, Haven is the most loving place mm. in the world and mm -hmm. very accepting of mm -hmm. every human, no matter what uh, their condition. Mm. You mentioned that uh, Salvation Army is the largest nonprofit landowner in San Francisco. Did I get that right? That's pretty amazing, which means that there might be some like physical resources in the city. Yeah, so unlike Haven, there, we're not envisioning one big campus, but we have a con Salvation Army has a concentration of properties south of Market. Um, there, there are five of them, and we've been we're, again Gensler and Webcore and others have been helping us with redevelopment plans over the last two years. Again, on a totally pro bono basis, devoting millions of dollars of services and helping us mm -hmm. make plans for the redevelopment um, of these five facilities into 1,600 beds with full wraparound services. Again, recovery, workforce development, life skills, and it can be on a very extended period of time. You know, the last year or so, somebody's living on one of these campuses. They may be living in a completely independent apartment. Um, they're out fully employed. But again, they have the support that they're learning that as they hit bumps that we all hit, in life along the way, there's support for them to learn, for us to learn how to how to deal with bumps in a way other than using, uh, you know, softening it with uh, with drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's a wonderful program with great potential. And again, this is just uh, uh, it's fabulous how many people are coming alongside and 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 giving of their time and resources to make it a reality. Uh, we've got a question from one of our friends who's with us on the call. Uh, I think it's from Sally, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who asks, will this project have government as a partner or can it be done without it? We've kind of addressed that, but you can probably explain more, more thoroughly. Well, probably not because, again, it will be... Uh, recovery will be expected. Um, again, if people are having... The difference with... I want to back up a little bit because traditionally transitional housing has gotten a bad rap because uh, people say, oh, those are really draconian. And if you take a drink, you get kicked out on the street and so on. This is the in the modern era, um, transformational housing is much more uh, partnership. Mm -hmm. If you're having mm -hmm. problems, we work with you. Um, we help you reset, try again. Um, maybe try a different way, maybe bring different resources alongside to work with you. The problem with the the strings attached to government funding is you cannot require recovery and you cannot require uh, part uh, participation in programming. Again, this is a voluntary program. People come into it because they right. want to. Right. It's not that we're forcing them to, but the government will not will not fund that. So at this point, we believe we're going to have to uh, raise all of the money privately, which in an area like San Francisco should not be that difficult. I mean, San Antonio is not a rich city. No, um, it's it's per capita income is you know, something like average is something like $47,000. But it's also highly dependent on tourism. And they understood mm -hmm. if they were going to keep the lifeblood of their city going, they had to do something about that. Um, San Francisco's loss is losing its tax base rapidly, is losing its tourism rapidly. Um, but there's still lots of money here. And there are lots of people who are concerned about it. And we believe that we can bring them in as partners and make this uh, bring this to fruition. Here's another question, Mary, uh, coming from one of our participants. Uh, won't San Antonio become a mag magnet for homeless nationwide? All the freebies have made California a bad kind of magnet. It's not, first of all, it's not freebies. They did have a problem with other cities busing their homeless to San Antonio. Ah. Um, so they started having a nine-month residency proof of residency requirement, and they got the word out, do not send your homeless here. We are not going to take care of them. Mm -hmm. Take care of your own. Mm -hmm. um, you're, come visit us. We'll show you how to do it. They're very right. generous in giving tours and sitting down with people. I, I, 
I spent a week there uh, doing this documentary. They are eager for others to emulate their success and, uh, and solve the problem. So let me just comment on something you said a moment ago, which is the part about government strings. Um, that's pretty weird to me. I mean, in, on the one hand, it seems like a perverse policy to pre that government funding would carry this restriction that even with voluntary entry programs, you can't expect or require uh, improvement. Um, that sounds like a self-defeating kind of government string. But on the other hand, that probably precludes government control or funding of some of these new initiatives that we're talking about. Maybe it's just as well in the long run that the government keeps its fingers out of the pie. Well, yeah, but it's, uh, it's also, so one of the case studies in our um, policy report is a, is a group called Solutions for Change in San, San Diego, which I also visited years ago, and it, was, it is a wonderful model. Mm. Um, they did have people using uh, federal vouchers for housing, and the government used that as a, coming after them and saying, well, then the people living in that housing, you cannot require uh, mm. sobriety, you cannot require participation in your program. Um, so they had to had to give that up. They wow. still have a campus that is they are able to fund privately, but they'd been they'd become quite an extensive operation. And they've had to cut that back considerably. So um, we're really the government is fueling this crisis. Uh, it's again, and the title of our policy report is "Good Intentions, mm -hmm. Bad Outcomes." Right. It's an important um, combination of thought there. And all of these things that sound wonderful, uh, you know, we're talking about the homeless housing. So therefore, housing solves the problem. Well, housing alone doesn't solve the problem. All you've done is move somebody inside with all of their problems um, unaddressed, mm -hmm. living in isolation, which often just means that people are isolated. So they're overdosing on their where they're not uh, don't have people around them who might help them get to uh, Narcan or other things. So in San Francisco, for example, under the last year under COVID, um, the city provided hotel rooms for people who are experiencing homelessness. And the problem is a lot of those people living in hotel rooms overdosed because there's nobody mm -hmm. around them to help them. Seven hundred and twelve San Franciscans overdosed last year. Wow. Three homeless people died of COVID last year. Um, so it's, it's wow. and we're already on track <laughs> through September. There are 511 overdose overdose deaths in San Francisco. Mm. So it's it's uh, you know one San Francisco police captain I talked to called these permanent supportive housing units a place where the homeless go to die more slowly. Mm. They're called out constantly because people are in psychosis. Mm -hmm. They're overdosing. They're setting fires. Uh, they're on the roof threatening suicide. You're taking people in pain and you're housing them and you're not giving them any help. And that is not compassionate. It's not helping anybody. It's making the problem much worse. And it's it's just, just getting them out of sight, yeah, out of you don't mind. Have to, exactly. Well, <laughs> at least I don't have to. And then it's degrading the neighborhoods that surround these hotels. I mean, they the government will not take responsibility for the safety of the people inside the hotels or for their surrounding neighborhoods. So you have stories after stories of the neighborhoods that have these hotels in them where they've placed individuals experiencing homelessness, and the neighborhoods have been destroyed. They're just mm. they're they're overrun with with people who have serious problems and have destroyed civil society throughout San Francisco. So, so notice then um, in what you've just described, I'm noticing that um, the difference between the kind of program that you saw in San Antonio, the kind that this partnership uh, along with us and the Salvation Army and others in San Francisco can begin fostering in the near future. And what you just described is that those um, no strings attached, just house you and get you off the street programs, they degrade neighborhoods. But the kind of actual uh, folded in with services and expectations, those kind of programs um, are far less likely to degrade neighborhoods than the so-called housing alone problem. Well, they actually make the entire city better. I mean, there's such yeah, a virtuous right. circle in San Antonio. It goes on and on and on, including the fact that um, they have off-duty police officers working security on campus. And the the point that that's important is that- Off-duty. 
Yeah, it, working on the campus with people who uh, have mental illness issues and, and substance abuse issues, the officers learn that uh, learn compassion. Mm. They learn who these people are, and importantly, they learn how to deal with them. They learn how to interact with them. So when they're back on the streets on their beat, and they come across somebody who's manic or uh, is high or otherwise, rather than just throwing the cuffs on them, throwing them on the ground and creating another George Floyd incident, they know how to deal with them. They know how to talk them down, calm them down. And then they can take them out to Haven. Haven has a sobering facility where people can you know, come down. Again, it's voluntary. And then once they're kind of of a right mind, they'll be given the choice. Well, would you like a place to stay or would you like to come into recovery and so on? It gets the police back on the street doing the job they're supposed to do. It creates an incredibly safe and harmonious city in which you don't have these, again, these incidents. Um, and it helps people who, who need help. What we've a concept. Got, yeah, what a concept. <laughs> right. Well, we've got one of our friends on the line. Jeffrey, uh, your mic is open. Can you voice your question? Sure. Um, I was curious, what is the, uh, the rationale however crack-brained it might be, against um, uh, requiring how, uh, homeless who are in permanent housing to make any improvements in their lives? There is a, a narrative about civil rights, and I have sat in, room, in a room with um, homelessness advocates who have said, the, we believe these are adults, and they have the right to make the decision to use drugs and live as they want. And my retort would be, uh, yes, but result, adults generally bear the consequences of their choices themselves. Um, again, this widespread uh, uh, outcome of such people dying uh, has a term as well. We call it dying with your rights on. Mm. Um, again, we're not for forcing you can't force anybody into recovery it doesn't work you can't force anybody to uh to turn their lives around it doesn't work but you can offer an array of places for people to go and that's all we're at is all that's all we're suggesting and, and offer as proof of concept is create an array of places shelters where people can be where they're safe uh they're loved they're cared for and respected um uh, but they're welcome to be drunk, high, whatever, uh, but again, have a curfew where they, they can't be out on the streets causing, causing problems at night and so on. And you're taking responsibility for the people that, in your care as well as the neighborhoods around them. Then through the full array of offering, if you want to transform your lives, here's a program that offers recovery. Here's a program that offers recovery and workforce development and so on. Here is a program that offers this, that, or the other. A full array of paths for people to choose. But then you restore the safe enjoyment of the streets by all the community. You offer people who happen to be, who may be in the, deciding that they want to live in the street. Um, here are places where you can go. But we don't want you feeling ill or, or, or uh, hurting, we're not going to leave you in the street. That's not compassionate. We have all these choices for you. Yeah. In some ways, I think Jeffrey's getting at the point of, you know, the structure of incentives, which actually respects human dignity, as opposed to enables people to make self-destructive or encourages them to make self-destructive choices. I'm thinking that in your past couple of years of working on this, you've actually talked with people who live on the street. You've had some conversations with people. Can you just tell us one or two of people that you met on the street in some of these uh, efforts to get acquainted, and what you learned? Well, again, what I mostly learned were, were, were stories that really made me recognize that there before the grace of God go I. Mm. Um, you have stories of people who grew up in terrible households in in very painful childhoods and you just can't imagine how you could survive that much less uh, many of the people with whom i talked have come through recovery and are now living rich and full lives but the pain 
that uh, we have in this country and that uh, unfortunately our government is also subsidizing uh, the the establishment of single mother headed households which do not help anybody um, is significant and then as I mentioned earlier the pain talking to some of these men who just you know, one man, he was living the American dream. He had his own home. He had his own business. He was doing very well. And then his wife left him. Now, you know, maybe he was behaving in a way that incented his wife to leave him, but it just led him into spiraling mm -hmm. uh, depression, addiction, and eventually lost his house, his car, everything. Wow. Uh, so there's just a, a tremendous amount of, of pain out there, and we need to be offering um, relief to it through, we have wonderful organizations in this country that are very good at helping people overcome their pain and transform their lives. Certainly, I'm very involved with the Salvation Army, and I love it, but there are lots and lots of organizations. Again, Haven for Hope has 174 nonprofit partners who are on campus offering the people there a full array. You know, what do you need? You know, we have all of these nonprofits that can provide it. Um, and it's a really synergistic, amazing, uh, again, virtuous community that's come mm -hmm. together and has really solved. Uh, let me just make this point. When Haven for Hope opened in 2010, its numbers of homeless were virtually the same as San Francisco's. And in the 10 years since it's been open, downtown unsheltered homelessness in San Antonio has declined by 80%. I stayed in San Antonio for a week doing the documentary, uh, walked around downtown alone at night and felt perfectly safe. In the wow. same 10 years, homelessness in San Francisco has gone up by 80%. I don't walk around in San Francisco during the daytime anymore by myself. When we were filming the documentary, we had to have security with us. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a madhouse and, and nobody, nobody can believe that we've come to accept that this is the way things can or should be. So let's talk a little bit about the immediate next steps ahead for this initiative. Um, one of the things you've emphasized, Mary, is that uh, the causes of any individual person's homelessness are often mul multiple and different people have different causes. You've also emphasized, as has uh, our report, that there are systemic issues at work too, which have to do with California regulations and housing policy and so forth. And all of them are intertwined with one another in a way that has trapped people. And so to, to, to un, undo uh, that ensnarement and to liberate as many people as possible back into living normal lives, everything kind of needs to be addressed. It, it sounds like what, what's needed here is what, what you're starting, which is a kind of public education effort coupled with the, the creation of this initiative in San Francisco in partnership with the Salvation Army and others. Um, how can we get the word out, Mary? Well, that's right, Graham. So this, in one way, this is your typical Independence Institute project. We did research. Uh, we have wonderful research that shows people what the underlying causes are, what the policies are currently, and what outcomes they're achieving. And then again, we look at alternatives and their outcomes, and then we propose uh, solutions and approaches that would achieve superior outcomes. And like every Independent Institute project, we want to get that out uh, through the media, through public events, through working with a network of associations and other partners, and again, helping individual San Franciscans, policymakers, uh, civic leaders, and others understand really more about this problem and open their eyes to uh, solutions that are not currently being considered. The difference with this uh, initiative, very excitingly, is we're very much putting these ideas then into action. We're providing uh, the guidance for this coalition, and we're a member of the co active member of the coalition, creating this demonstration project that we hope will uh, come to fruition in San Francisco and demonstrate in San Francisco's results similar to San Antonio has achieved. Mm -hmm. And then again, be a beacon to communities around the country of, hey, uh, this makes things better. And you know, I, I'm encouraged too, because the people who care about um, helping those who are in, in big trouble on the streets, 
uh, whose hearts are absolutely in the right place will be gratified by uh, this pilot project in San Francisco. But I also think that those very same people will be much more interested in listening to the whole diagnosis, including the policy ramifications, than they might otherwise be. Uh, and so our message from the Independent Institute, which has a lot to do with recognizing uh, the dynamism of, of individual initiative, um, we'll be probably getting to a whole bunch of people uh, who, who be, may be willing to realize that it matters for the homeless whether we have appropriate housing policy uh, and, and the dynamism of individual market in California. Right. And I think the documentary makes a, is a very good tool for reaching yeah. people who right. who won't otherwise become aware of it. I mean, the thing is, the exodus of... <laughs> The exodus of the rich from San Francisco and the Silicon Valley uh, has made the news. But a lot of people who could leave have chosen to stay. They mm -hmm. want San Francisco to be our home. Right. That's right. I want to stay here as well. Right. Um, and in talking with people, I mean, there's what I what I get is anger about the way things are, certainly. But more importantly, a real desire for things to be better and a real mm -hmm. desire. There's increasing desire for people to be a part of making it better and, and, and recognition that this is not something we can delegate to government. Government is not good at this. I mean, Demonstrably. <laughs> demonstrably not good at this. Um, communities, people in commu working together in community are good at this. And I see a lot of people who want to be a part of the solution, want to be involved, but they've been very frustrated because they don't know what they can do. Right. So hopefully with our initiative, and again, uh, Graham, can maybe also show our website that we've created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you can get a lot more information by heading to this website, which you can narrate here, Mary. Yeah, so it's called beyondhomeless.org. Um, as you can see, it houses the documentary, houses our policy report. Um, it's also, as it as we continue to develop it, we'll have lots of information uh, where people can learn more about the problems and their solutions. And importantly, see the Get Involved tab. So right now there's some volunteer opportunities um, and we'll be adding to that of, and we'll want to have you know FAQs of what you can do in your mm -hmm. neighborhood, um, how you can help form your own coalition in your city um, and so on and so forth. So we really want this to be a dynamic tool for people to get involved and uh, be part of the solution and learn how they can be part of the solution. So we need to get the word out. We're about to begin a big effort to do just that. I mean, we've done some serious research. We've got a documentary. There's a pilot program uh, in the offing in San Francisco, literally mm -hmm. to be on, on the ground there. Um, to be honest with our friends who are here because they're our friends, um, we need financial support to make these big public launch events happen. Uh, to just get the word out regarding our analysis and our report, to get the documentary widely seen, uh, to set up the infrastructure to help people who want to just do hands-on help you know, with those in this pilot project who need help. We need resources to get the public education word out about the bigger policy picture. So all of those things um, are sort of needing attention, and we're grateful for any help that we can get to do those things. Right, Mary? Yeah, I'm so grateful for the support that's made it possible for us to uh, do this project to date that funded the documentary. As I said, the documentary has absolutely changed my life, and I think it's going to change a lot of lives. We're so grateful for our donors who've made that possible. Um, and But yeah, this is, this is a huge issue. There's a large uh, group of vested interests that don't want that want to protect the status quo. It's, some people call it the homeless industrial complex that we're up against. Uh, we can help people and, and try to stop <laughs> the status quo from keeping hurting people and hurting more people. Mm -hmm. But it is going to take um, it is going to take all of us working together. And uh, money is a part of that, but certainly other things are too. If we can make a dent uh, in San Francisco, both in the experience of the homeless and in public understanding of the issues surrounding it, then there's hope that that can spread back to the whole country, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you know, it's San Francisco is right. worth, worth the effort. <laughs> yeah. Powerful, powerful demonstration for Seattle, Portland, Texas, you know, all of you name it. I talked to somebody who was in Washington, D.C. last week, and they said the tents are just proliferating. Right. So this is a, is a problem everywhere. 
So if we can demonstrate success here, you know, again, the poster child of homelessness, uh, we can right. we can get huge impact. What should they sort of be expecting to see as we move forward, Mary? Well, the policy report will be released. It's actually available on the beyondhomeless.org site now if people are interested, as well as the executive summary, as well as some of the infographics that are taken from it that are just pictured, says a thousand words. Um, we're still working on plans for the distribution of the documentary, but it will be out very soon. Um, we are trying to pose it for ultimate uh, impact and so on. Um, and then we'll be updating through our usual channels of communication, especially with our donors, letting you know progress yeah. um, and so on. So thank you so much. Some of you may want, for example, to attend one of our public launch events, which we'll be telling you about as we get them shaped up more. Um, maybe there are people who might like to host private screenings in their homes. There's a digital platform that we're going to be making available. So you could probably bring in maybe 20 people that you think that you know who might care about this. You can connect with us and maybe volunteer to do a private screening in your home. Uh, there's a bunch of ways you can help. Yeah, and then we could come out and, and uh, facilitate a conversation. Again, the documentary is only 38 minutes, so it would make a great evening, you know, show yeah. the documentary and then afterwards have a conversation with your neighbors of, you know, how can we apply these lessons here in our own neighborhood? It would be fun to have Mary Thoreau come into your living room, right, after her documentary. <laughs> I can't think of anything more fun than having Mary Thoreau in your <laughs> living room. <laughs> but second best, I could even come, and we have others who know even more than, than I do. Um, so all of that said, you know, um, watch your email inbox, friends, and thank you so much for standing with us. Many of you have made this possible thus far, and we're going to do so much more. We're going to make a big difference, um, and people will be surprised, and it'll be um, very encouraging. So uh, with all that said, Mary, last words to our friends. Thank you so much, and stay tuned. Yeah, absolutely. Stay tuned. Okay, so thank you again, everybody. Signing off here from the Independent Institute in Oakland, California. Uh, I'm Graham Walker with Mary Thoreau. You can always go to our regular website, independent.org, of course, to get the latest on information about this and many other topics. And of course, you can donate through our website. But um, mostly, thank you for joining us today. We'll keep in touch. Bye, everybody. <laughs>